So my name is Jakub, as you've heard. I work at SCALC in Poland. And uh, today I'm going to talk about fantastic monads and where to find them, whatever that means. So uh, let's begin by outlining what we are going to do. Why are we you know, going to sit through this 30, 45 minutes of my talk? Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, write a simple HTTP app. It doesn't really matter that it's HTTP, it's just something that you know, some uh, controller-based uh, based, uh, HTTP server. Uh, and uh, it's not going to be as simple as all the uh, Hello World cases. We'll do some nasty things. And by nasty things, I mean validation, which normally no nobody would like. But we're in the Scala world, so I'm ex going to explain to you why it's actually quite pleasant. And then we'll try to decouple the whole thing from futures which is going to be the ultimate goal of this talk and of the uh, monad stuff. So, uh, spoiler alert, I already did it. Uh, so, the change looks like this. I think you can't see anything here. Uh, so, in the original version, we'll have a book service. Uh, the whole thing will be just uh, like a library uh, backend. So, we're going to have a book service that has a dependency on a book DAO. And everything it does is return, d d do some stuff with the inputs of the, fun of the functions it, it has, and return some futures with some other values. So pretty simple, I would say. And then we'll have the roots for HTTP. Can I scroll down? No, I can't. I need to zoom in again. OK, thanks, Mac. So yeah, uh, these are the roots. Just one for now, but there will be more. So you can see that we are using a future. Uh, returning function here, and we actually have a future in the service above. Now, in the, uh, in the updated version, we're going to have something quite more sophisticated. We're going to have this one little thing here. So maybe not, of you, all, not all of you know, but this is a higher-kinded type, uh, higher-kinded kind of generic type. So uh, what it means is basically that book service requires a type parameter that also has one type parameter. Uh, I hope it's simple enough and everyone understands. Is that right? Is, that, is anyone lost? Not yet? OK. You'll be lost later. Um, we also have a book DAO as before, but now it also is parameterized with that f. And I'm going to show you why in a second. We also got this nasty little thing that I want don't want to show you yet. You can guess what happens after M. You may, you may be afraid of it, but it's not as scary as you think. So yes, it's a monad of F. And I'm going to explain to you uh, why we need this and why it's useful for our case. So what else has changed in this example is that all the features are gone. There is no single mention of future in this snippet. There are just Fs, and this is not a type LS for future. It's just an abstract type parameterized with one value, as you can see here. <coughs> and everything else is unchanged. And the roots are the same, because why not? So uh, you may be asking, this looks quite complex. Why decouple? Why do this? Why shoot ourselves in the foot? Well, we don't shoot ourselves in the foot. It's actually the other way around. So one reason for decoupling for our services or backends from futures is uh, refactorability. I don't know if that's a word. I just made it up. Anyways, uh, what this means is that we can refactor more easily if we decide to leave future and use some other effect type in the, in the future, like I.O. Or, or task from other libraries or whatnot. So, if you've been writing Scala services for long enough, for days, for months, you've most likely seen Future Successful and written hundreds of these yourself. So this is one strongly coupling point to Futures because there's just uh, no generic way to, to construct a, you know, a future in simple Scala without knowing it's a future. So we need to do Future Successful in some cases, or Future Failed. And we need things like future sequence, future traverse, to, for example, create a future out of a list of futures. So these things are uh, problematic because if you want, and yeah, that's, that's 
right? These are problematic because they are uh, only meant to be used with features, of course, as the names suggest. And we might want to change them to, I don't know, task, now, whatever. But we would have to replace hundreds and hundreds of lines of code, and we don't really want to do that, because why? So, um, what, this, what removing these uh, coupling points gives us is easier mocking for uh, in-memory debugging. Uh, like in, if you want a data source that doesn't operate on futures, then why operate on futures and wrap everything in future successful when you could just return the value straight away without uh, future successful and so on. And also you can do the same for tests, which uh, I think is a pretty good thing. And as, as I said before, it's easier to refactor to task and so on because it's just a change in one or two places instead of hundreds. Uh, it may not look very clear that the benefit is there, but I promise you'll see it later. So now what we, do we need to know before we do this? First of all, we need to know what type classes are. And we need to know a couple of them to, to write uh, functioning services in Scala. So the first one is functor. The next one is applicative. Then the monad. And traverse, which I think is also quite useful. There are way more in, in uh, one sec. There are way, way more. Uh, of these type classes that uh, are available in the Scala world in various libraries, but these ones are just the ones I think will benefit us most. And you most likely know Functor and Monad and Traverse. Just you, you don't just use their names; you just use their functionality, anyways. So uh, to to use these type classes to get them and to be able to uh, possess their power. I'm going to use a library called CATS, which is a type level project. Type level is an organization that supports independent projects that do some pretty complex uh, things with Scala that allow you to do uh, pretty complex things easily. So what CATS is, it's a lightweight, modular, and extensible library for functional programming. And it's inspired by SCSI, which is more or less the same thing. And what it does, in a sense, is provide type classes. You, you may not know what they are yet, but I'm going to explain. And instances for them, and some data structures, which are extremely useful as well. So to use CATS uh, to get a more in-depth look at how to use it, uh, I think you can take a look at the official documentation. It's pretty cool. There will be more links at the end, and, more, more, and these links will be there as well. Uh, with some extra information. So let's see uh, type classes. What are type classes and why do we need them here? So imagine you want to be able to come up with uh, an empty value of any type um, if you know how to, how to do it for the type. Uh, so imagine you want to write a function that produces two values, uh, two empty values, or three of them, or a list of them. So uh, you can't really use like int.new or string.new or your class.new uh, and just have a new, uh, new value in a generic way without type classes, I think. So we're, we're going to define a trait uh, called empty with an, a type parameter t that will be able to provide an empty value. So. Uh, now we can create a function called two empties, for example, that will create a tuple with two elements of that type, like two empty elements of this t type. And it will require an implicit instance of empty of t. And the implementation is pretty simple. It's just e.empty. The parentheses are missing here, but uh, you get the point. We just call the method twice and have two values in the result. And it's not directly coupled to int or, or string or anything. So next, we define an implicit instance of empty for int, which will just provide 0 as the empty value. And then we can call two empties of int. And it just works. It will just give us two values of type int, which are equal to 0, as predicted. Now, what if we want to, to use it with other types, like strings? So let's try that. 
And at this point, we'll just get a compiler error because there is no instance and no implicit instance of empty of string. So what can we do about that? We can just define one. So uh, here I'm using the um, single abstract method syntax, but it's mostly the same. It's just a new, oh, sorry. I zoomed in on the wrong screen here. Uh, so um, the new empty of string will just return an empty string every time, surprisingly. So if we, now we, if we call two empties of string, we'll just get two empty strings and it's all checked at compile time. And it'll work for any kind of type that you come up with if you, create, if you have an implicit instance. And that's actually what type classes are. So empty is a type class in this case. Uh, it just has one type parameter and allows us to, uh, to add some functionality to a set of types without modifying the actual type. We don't touch the source code of int or string. So what can you do with this? Oh yeah, uh, and there are some conventions uh, with type classes. One of them, um, or two of them, are shown here. The first one is that uh, the companion object of a type class in Scala would, would normally have a method called apply, uh, which is a special method in Scala. And it'll take an implicit value of this em empty of the same type class and return it just like ad an identity function. And why it's useful is because then we can use empty of t dot empty and we'll just get the empty value again because this is just shorthand for empty apply t dot empty. It's pretty simple, I guess. And there's uh, the, the second thing is some syntactic sugar for type classes in Scala, which is this colon thing. So uh, this uh, type signature is actually the same. In, after the disregarding, it looks the same as, as before. So we just have an implicit uh, empty of, of t. So we're going to use this syntax later, uh, some examples. But uh, well, that's all you need to know for now. So. If you're still puzzled about what type classes are, and uh, if you think they are not useful or if you haven't seen them at all, I'm going to show you that you actually may have seen them if you've worked with, for example, sorted in the standard library or some. So they are functions defined on some generic sequence classes traits in Scala. And they actually use type classes. For example, so ordered uses a type class called ordering. And some is a type class called numeric, which defines how values of this type B are added to each other. So knowing that, we can go to the type classes in cats, and I'm going to explain a few of them now before we go to the actual project. So the first one, as I said before, is functor. And what the functor is, is basically another type class that has one type parameter, which is a higher kind of type. So it can be substituted with uh, a list, an option, a future, basically anything that has one type parameter. Um, and what it does, it just has one uh, method you need to implement if you're creating, creating an instance, and it's called map. And it's just the same as map on options, on, on lists, on futures, or on anything in the standard library, except it's more generic, right? It just takes the value of, of f of t and the function from t to another type and returns an f of this other type. So if you think about it as a transformation for some computations, then if you have one box, one computed uh, value in some effect type like future, then given a functor, you can take that, you cannot really access the value inside the computation directly. But you can take this value and apply a function to it and get another result of the computation. So if you have a future of t and we map on it, you can have a future of u. Simple enough, I hope. Now the next one, oh yeah, and you can, we can use it like, like this, for example, with, uh, we can create a function that will map all the values of an arbitrary functor to, to a number um, higher by one. So if we have a, a, any kind of functor of ints, we can have another one 
uh, and we can just map the, the functor with a function adding one to them. Pretty simple, I would say, again. So, yeah, this is one way. We can just summon an, a functor using the apply function, which is already defined. Or with CAS, we can do this by importing some, uh, some syntax and just relying on implicit conversions to add this map method to our type. So it's the same thing. And we can do it with a list, we can do it with a function, with an option. Uh, so in this case, if we call it with list, we'll get a list. If we call it with an option, we'll get an option, uh, which will be a sum in this case. And if we provide none, we'll get a none again, which is still an option event. Now, the second uh, type class I wanted to show you is applicative. And it's slightly more complex. Here's a simplified version of it. So uh, applicative is actually a functor. So if you want an applicative, you'll need to implement map as well. Uh, or maybe it's implemented by, by these. Anyways, uh, it has the capabilities of a functor. And it also does have some more capabilities. For example, take this method pure here. Uh, it allows you to take a value of type A, of an arbitrary type A, and wrap it in a context, in a, in a box, in a computation of this type F. So, uh, for example, you might, you might see this as future successful, as list apply, or, or sum dot apply. Uh, so, it's, again, it's a more generic way to say that. And what it also does is, uh, it allows you to combine two computations together. So if we had functor before, we had one box or one computation with a value, and now we can have two boxes that are created independently of each other. So they might be created at the same time or, or one after the other, but it doesn't matter if they don't depend on each other. So if we have two computations of some types, we can extract the values inside them <laughs> and apply a function to, uh, to the values and get a new box. And this uh, AP function that we have to implement is pretty similar to what I just said, but it has one box with a function and one box with a value. So if we take this function from A to B and we take this A, we should be able to have a, a B. That's all we need to do in this implementation. And we can use it for, for uh, many things that I'm going to show later. Now, the M word. So the monad type class is just an applicative with a flat map method. So it's, again, just like a flat map in the normal Scala world, just like flat map on lists, on options. Uh, so given a, a computation of some value, and a function that takes this value from the inside and pr produces a new computation, a new wrapped value, we can basically get the result of the new value, the, the new computation. So with applicatives, we couldn't do that because we would end up with nested Fs. And in this case, we can somehow flatten them and have a flat result, F of B. And we're going to have to use this if you want to abstract on futures in most applications. Now, Traverse is slightly different. Uh, it does something completely different, actually. Uh, the only thing you need to implement for Traverse is the Traverse function. Uh, I'm not going to explain it now because the type signature is quite annoying, complex. But you may be familiar with sequence, more familiar with it. So given an, a G, uh, which is a higher candidate type, and an A. If we have uh, an F of G of A, we're able, we're able to, to get a G of F of A. So imagine you have a piece of paper, and you store it in a box, and you store it, uh, the box in a room. So if you call sequence on that room, you'll get a box which contains a room, which contains a piece of paper. I know it's hard to imagine uh, a, a room fit into a a box, but that's the essence of it. So a more practical use case, if you have a list of futures and you call sequence on it, you have a future of lists. Simple as that. You just need the, the appropriate uh, implicit in, this, in scope. So this is Traverse. 
And uh, this is sequence. So traverse is a more generic uh, thing than sequence. Uh, traverse basically allows you to provide a function as well. So you can think of traverse as, as map and then sequence, because that's, uh, you'll get the same result with this. So sequence is just a special case of traverse, which just uses the ident identity function, more or less. So I hope you understand these type classes now, at least uh, half of them <laughs> but at this point. So we're going to look at the code. So let me switch to mirroring. Um, no, not this. Uh, Okay, is the code large enough or too small still? Can you see it in the back? No? Can you see it now? Okay, so uh, let's see what I have in this project. I have um, a book DAO, which will be the data source of our book related stuff. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong version. Uh, I have the book DAO, which does some stuff with features. As you can see, we have uh, a book service, which depends on this DAO. We have a roots file with the roots, the HTTP roots. We have the main class, which is actually an object. And we have some data. So in the da database, we just have the, uh, the book class, which has an ID, an ISBN number, and a name. Uh, the ID is just a value class. It should, it's just a detail. And we have to transport uh, classes. We have a book to create, which is going to be used as a request uh, if you want to create a book and, and save it to the database. It has an ISBN and a name. And we have a rent book request, which, just, which is just a wrapper over book ID. And we have some errors defined. We have the error trait and some error implementations, for example, errors for renting books and errors for creating books. So let's see how that, that all uh, ends up in an application. So if you look at BookDAO, uh, we have all these simple fu uh, future learning methods. Um, so we have uh, an implementation of BookDAO that uses just an in-memory uh, map, basically. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what it does, some pretty boring stuff with, with a map. It just returns some values or, or changes some values. Uh, it should be pretty obvious what it does just, just from the type signatures. So uh, we're going to use these methods in our service, which looks like this. Uh, in the service, we have, all done. We have the method find books, which, can you see it? Okay which returns a future of list of, of book. Uh, so it just makes a simple call to the DAO. We have a function at book that takes a book to create request and returns the future of validated null. I'm going to explain that in a second. Uh, and it will return either some errors, some book create errors, or a book ID. And we have rent book, which will take a rent book request and return a future of rent result, which is either a rent error, one of them, or just unit in case everything went well. And here is this rent books, which takes a request that has many uh, books to rent, and it tries to rent each of these books, and then concatenates the results by future sequence. Uh, how all that is used in the controllers is just you know take an entity from the request and and call the appropriate method. There's one exception in which we uh, have this custom handle validation stuff, but it is just for the custom serializer I wanted to use. Uh, so it doesn't really matter now. So let's look at how this all is implemented. Let's begin by walking through rentbook. So what rentbook is. What it does is it tries to find a book um, as the first thing it does. Then uh, at the same time, more or less, basically it depends on the execution context. It tries to, to see if the book is rented already. Uh, so um, 
just checking if it's rented is not enough to be able to, for the app to be able to tell us if we can rent it or not. We also need to know if the book actually exists. So we try to find the instance of it. So uh, having these features, we take the first one, and if it's an empty value, we'll get book not found in the left, in um, either. But if it's actually existing, we'll get a success, a right value in the either. So this is what book either is. It's either a book not found error or a book. And it's rented is just a, a, a boolean at this point. So if, uh, if we already have an error from the non-existent book, it's clearly uh, visible that we can't rent it, so we can just return a future successful with this error. However, if it's there, we can try to rent it uh, with another function. So now we check if, it, if the book is rented, which we got from this future before, which we, well, the result of it was passed to this rent if not rented function. Uh, so if it's already rented, we just uh, come up with a failure and return that. Return book already rented as an error. Otherwise, we make a request to, to rent book, which will just return a future of unit. And we map that to a write to have a, uh, a type, uh, a different type than just an error or, or something like that. So combining all these functions, we have rent book, which should return the appropriate uh, error. Now let's see add book, which is uh, slightly more complex, I think. So what it does is it tries to validate the book and then traverse the result to DAO save book, which just takes the book and returns the future of book ID if it's, uh, well, it just uh, assumes the result is always correct. But first we need to uh, make some server-side validations before because we, before we make a call to the database. So we do that in validated book, and we create this validated null. Now, what is it? So validated, validated null is the type alias for validated of non-empty list of some errors and some success value. So I'm not gonna explain all the details of how validated works, but just so you know uh, what you can expect is, uh, right, non-empty list is just uh, a list with a head that doesn't throw, for sure. And, and head and tail will never throw in an, an, an empty list. Uh, and validated is quite similar to either. So the only implementations of <laughs> validated are invalid, uh, sorry, invalid, invalid. So valid has a success type, a success value, and is just a validated of anything, of nothing, and this success and invalid is the other way around. So, uh, yeah, these are the only values that you can have uh, as, a, as a validated instance. And the difference between validated and either is that, uh, well, either is defined in the standard library, validated is defined in cats, and it also, ha as it's defined in cats, it can have all the type class in instances out of the box without any additional imports. And what it also does that either doesn't is if, if the error value fulfills some, some uh, laws and it has a specific instance of a type class that I'm not gonna mention today, uh, well, what it can do, what validated can do is given two or more validations, it can basically accumulate all the errors if there are any. Uh, if this sounds crazy, I'm going to show you that in practice. So here we create two validations, one for ISBN and one for name. So this one is of type validated with some error and string. And this one is validated of another error and string. Um, can you see it? I hope you can see it. So without delving into details of how I do it, is if the length of the ISBN is equal to 10, we'll get a, a valid uh, ISBN. And if it's not, we'll get an invalid with this error value, which is, in, well, incidentally also invalid something, but it doesn't matter. So this is one uh, validated, and the other one is for name. So if the name 
has a length of between one to 10 characters, then it's gonna be a valid value, a valid name. Otherwise, it's gonna be an invalid with this error. So now we can compose the uh, validations with accumulating the results uh, using this kind of weird, weird syntax from cats. It used to be different, but now the, the old syntax is deprecated and we have to do it that way. That's why IntelliJ bleeds. Uh, so what it does is, if any of these validations, the, the first one is known to be valid <coughs> as well, uh, always. If any of these contains any error, any validation error, any invalid, uh, the errors are going to be accumulated and this function will never be called. This is just book apply. It will never be uh, used and called. However, if all of them are successful, if all of them are valid, then we're going to end up with a valid value of book applied to all the values from the validations. So I'm going to show you that in practice in case it doesn't look clear now. Mm, I think we can run it right now. So if we run it, uh, the, the current implementation has, uh, is it working? Yes, it's working. You can see it, okay. So the current implementation has two books in the store. Uh, the first one is functional programming in Scala, whatever. The second one is functional programming in Java. Um, okay. Um, so I know that the second one is already rented and we can't rent it again because it's already rented. And the first one is not rented, so we can try to rent it. Uh, let's try renting with book ID one. And I got this pre-type, this pre-result, which is just unit. So it went successfully. Let's try again. And now we see that book already rented was, was used instead, which is what we wanted. Now let's try to rent a book that doesn't exist with ID like something like this. And now we'll get book not found instead. So I think this is all what we expected. Now let's try to add a book and I'm gonna show you why this validation stuff is useful and why it's so nice to have it. So if you remember, the ISBN was supposed to be exactly 10 characters long and the name was supposed to be one to 10 characters long. So you can clearly see these, these values are longer than that. So let's see what happens. Now I'll get an array of, of two invalid values. That's also a bad request, I think. Yeah, because um, that's how I serialized it. So we have the invalid ISBN and invalid name errors. Now let's change something and make the ISBN correct, for example. Now we just get invalid name. And if we make the name correct, we'll just get invalid ISBN. And if we make both uh, information correct, we'll get an ID. And this is actually a random string. I didn't even know that that's what, that's what the random string looks like in Scala. But it's nice. You can, well, this one even looks like a ladder. Cool. So now if we look at all the books, we're going to have a new one with this new, brand new, shiny, weird ID. I'm not going to guess what language that is. I hope it's not Java. So we can try to rent it, but I guess you, you, you have the point. Let's run the application again so that I have a new a clear state. Now we have two books again. I can add some fake books to it. Okay, so there are plenty of them. Now let's try to rent many books, which is where Traverse will be used. So let's try to rent the book one, which is gonna be a success. The book two, which is gonna fail because it's already rented. And the book three, which is gonna fail because there's no such book. So we got a right with a value of unit, a left with book already rented, and a left with book not found, which is exactly what we wanted. Uh, so I think we were successful in our application. Now, how much time do I have? Yeah, I still have some time. So let's see the updated version, the one with the Fs. So what it looks like is not much has changed. We just have this, uh, this uh, higher-kinded type here and in BookDAO. 
So BookDAO doesn't even know what monads are. It just knows that it has a type parameter that's higher kinded. And all the futures are gone. There's no more mention of future in this file or in the book service. So BookDAO only knows it has an F, and all the functions now return F of something. And now the book, mock BookDAO doesn't return futures anymore as well, because now it, uh, it operates on a higher kinded type uh, of ID. And what ID is, it's a nice trick uh, that m works with a type ls, which, which is type ID of A equals A. So it's a nice way to, to make A a higher kinded type. So instead of futures, all the functions here just return the raw values, like a list of books. So it's the same as ID of list of book, but it's simpler <laughs> this way. So you can easily, uh, easily return values without any future successful or anything like that. So this is the DAO. Now let's take a look at the service again. So the service also has a type, a hair candy type. It also has an, a monad instance, which is going to be used for some things. It's not used at all in find books. This one could live without the, the implicit instance. But at book, for example, uh, <coughs> not here. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so add book uses the, mm, the monad instance in Traverse because Traverse requires an applicative and the monad is also an applicative, so it's supplied here, as you can see, as an implicit argument. Now, rent book uh, was more complex before. No, uh, it's more or less the same. <coughs> so the difference here is that we'll have a few m.pure calls, which are just the calls from, from applicative. So we just wrap a value inside an m. Previously, we would have future successful. Now we have m pure, which is more generic because it doesn't know anything about futures. And there's one more of them here, the same thing. And we also use some uh, f functions from functor. Uh, well, we, we just use map. Here. It's added by the functor syntax uh, here. So we can map on the f of an f of unit and have a, an f of range result. We use map again here with an f of option to have a, an f of either. And I'm wondering if I use any other syntax. Yes, and of course. A full comprehension is just syntactic sugar for a flat map and map and, and so on. Uh, so if we desugar it, we can see that flat map is used. And it's imported by the cat syntax flat map, flat map object. So again, we had to add some imports, but now we are fully generic and we don't use futures at all, uh, which I think is a pretty good thing. And if you need any kind of uh, future specific stuff like, like future failed. There's a, mo a type class for that and for many other things. Um, what else we need here? Oh, right. So we have this rent books, which previously did a future sequence, if you remember. It looked like future sequence mm, request map rent book. That would be it. So now what we do is just uh, call that sequence on the result. <laughs> Or we could make it uh, shorter, maybe not more readable, but shorter, with request traverse rent book. And traverse and sequence are brought by the import of syntax for traverse. So this is the book service. Let's see what's changed in the main uh, class, the main object. Now we have a book service of results, which is some higher kind of type somewhere else. And in this case, we provide a book service, which is always going to be the same because it's, it doesn't matter what, what uh, <coughs> data store we use. But now we provide the MacBook DAO with the type ID. So we, you can guess that the result is going to be ID, and it actually is. And what uh, the roots file expects is, again, a book service of ID. Now, if we wanted to change this ID, in our production code to a future, for example. We can do that quite easily. So, uh, right, I changed something in book service. Why? 
uh, formatting, of course. So let's switch to the version. Not much has changed, really. Uh, the only changes are just some imports, the uh, implementation of the DAO, and that's mostly it. So if you see the DAO, the new DAO, uh, now we have a real book DAO, which actually uses a future as the um, higher candidate type. So it may be uh, a DAO from Slick, using a database from Slick. So if you've worked uh, with Slick and uh, so on with similar uh, libraries, you know that all the methods in the database return futures or, or streams. So in this case, we'll use futures. And now, if we use a book DAO with future, all the methods inside will have to be implemented with futures. It doesn't matter now because we don't really care about Slick and the stock, but you can clearly see that future is what we needed here. And if I just tried to return a list of book, it just wouldn't compile. Hopefully I can show you that. Yeah, it just won't compile. But with future, it compiles just fine. And uh, also on the result type, was also changed to future. And that's mostly it. And I had to re-import the instances for future in, in main. And an um, execution context, because that's needed for the applicative and so on. But that's it. So we've achieved our goal. We've abstracted on the, on the futures. So let me just see if I have anything else. <laughs> Shit. Let's get back to the slides. Right. Uh, so we've seen the, the benefit. You've seen us uh, come from a version with futures to one without any futures, and then replace the the data source, uh, which, which used ID, with a future one. Now, if you wanted to do that with future uh, and replace it with task or, or something else, you just have to edit a few files, like two or three of them in this case, instead of replacing every future successful, every future sequence, and so on. So I think it's pretty cool. And it may sound abstract and unreal that you can do it, but it actually can work, and I've seen this work on production. Not with CADS, but with SCSI, but it's, it was mostly the same thing. Now, if you want to find out more about how to do these things, how, what, what, theory, what the theory behind is, uh, you can see the, these links. Probably there's going to be a lot more material on the web. But you can see our blog. You can see the new upcoming book from Underscore on CADS. Uh, you can, of course, uh, learn some things about category theory, because that's where, where monads, flat, uh, functors, and so on come from. You can see some other tutorials like herding cats and read the uh, cats documentation, which I think is pretty well written. So actually, that's all I have today. So thank you for uh, your attention. And the slides will be available here. The code will be here. And I'm sure you have some questions, so I'll be happy to answer them if you if you have any. Okay.